Okay, people. So I am joined by Tommy Bolding. Yep. Is that, oh, man. I, I, first, first time. Yeah. Oh, that's a relief because I wasn't quite sure if I was pronouncing your name correctly. But Tommy Bolding, who um, has just directed Hounded, a new, uh, oh, I don't know, like I'd say kind of a psychological horror. Maybe. Uh, I uh, I got asked this the other day. I'm I'm pitching it a survival thriller. So I think that's I think that's pretty. Yeah, on the nose. You know what? Yeah, that's that's a that's a lot better because I was thinking like, oh, how would you? But yeah, survival, obviously. So now I missed that. Nice, but yeah, hounded, which um, definitely interesting, man. Definitely interesting. Like, how did because. You know, you didn't write this, right? No. So how do you get on board a project like this? Um, well, uh, fundamentally through uh, the producer, who in this case was Ben Jakes. And um, I worked with Ben before as an editor. Um, uh, and I've known Ben for close to 20 years, but we've worked together in the film industry for uh, the best part of, 10 years, if not more now, to be honest. Um, in fact, the very first uh, short film I ever edited was produced by Ben, uh, which was called Life Sentence. And I think that was in 2012. So yeah, 10 years ago now. Um, oh. And then and then we've been doing, we've worked together a few times and then we've gone off and done our own, uh, like worked on, he's produced, like he did the Hat and Garden job and he's done one shot and mm. all sorts of different movies. And then I was obviously off editing other movies as well. Um, but he always knew that I wanted to uh, try my hand at directing. And um, so I think this was a case of he had a script that uh, Signature Entertainment were interested in financing and um, coming on board as, as, as the backers of the film and distributing it or doing sales. And um, but the level of what they, what everybody thought the, the film was worth, I think, was always a case of, well, it's probably a project for a first-time director um, because it wasn't a massive budget and that, therefore it probably was less of a, a risk for them. Um, and so I think at that point, Ben thought, ah, well, hang on a minute, Tommy wants to try his hand, so let's send him the script, which Ray and Dean, who wrote um, Hat and Garden Job, had written and worked with Ben before. And... Uh, yeah, he sent it to me and I um, loved it straight away. I mean, like it's changed a bit, but not massively since then. Like, uh, we developed it a bit and then uh, we would have shot in, um, originally we were hoping to shoot in uh, 2020, but then obviously COVID came along and yeah. messed up everybody's plans. And um, okay. so we took that op we took that opportunity to, to just spend some time developing the script a bit further, which has benefited, benefited it in the long run. Um, but yeah, so yeah, essentially it came through Ben to me and it was um, a case of, do, are you interested? And if you are interested, what's your pitch for it? Um, and then I sort of had to sell myself a bit to Signature um, because obviously they didn't know me as a director. They, they were aware of my work as an editor, but um, not as a director. So I did one of these sizzle reels. I, I'm not sure if you're fam familiar with them where you basically cut loads of shots from other movies that exist and splice them together with an existing piece of music and um, try and sell your feeling for the film. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously you're not showing them what actors you're going to get and you're not using lines of dialogue that you're going to get. But it's essentially kind of like a, a, a pirate trailer, <laughs> for, for, want of a, for want of a better description. Um, yeah, so I cut one of those together using obviously my years of experience as an editor, which is one of the things I ha can sell myself with. And um, and uh, yeah, we showed it to Ben and I showed it to Katie and Liz at Signature, and I don't know if other people at Signature watched it, but they responded really well to it. They said this is exactly how we felt the film should feel. So we were all on the same page, and from then on, it was a case of cracking on with it, really, and. Um, yeah, get, getting on with it. Interesting. Yeah, because I think that's something you always wonder, like, how does someone get that opportunity? Like, what are the steps for that? Because we've seen first-time directors come in and really just do a fantastic job. But 
it's hard. You know what I mean? Like studios want that tried and tested. So yeah. It's like yeah, what yeah. You have to do. So you yeah, so it's like basically you're selling yourself with that sizzle reel, you know. Yes, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. I had I mean I had I had directed like a, a 17 minute sort of drama short before, maybe four or five years ago. But I mean, which shows that I've done something. So I wasn't <laughs> completely like uh going into it completely cold. Uh but other than that and things I'd made back at university, I didn't really have a lot else to, to show other than, I guess, the choices I've made as an editor. Um, and and I think like some of the films that I've worked on, I think, although I'd never actually worked with Signature before, like I think they're, they're of a similar scale and of a similar um, style to some of the films that Signature put out. Um, so I think they probably were aware of some of my work on films as an editor and therefore again that's just it's just a bit more reassurance isn't it that like I've got that experience behind mm. behind the uh, obviously not behind the camera but in post production yeah and i i have to say i think um the power was extremely good extremely well right. put together and i think that picked up that got a lot of buzz from what I remember seeing around when yeah you know, just it did when I, yeah yeah that, yeah that I thought that was just you know so well well crafted so um yeah when I saw that you edited that I was like ah oh, yeah fantastic great thank you yeah 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 no the power did well um I think it even got um it got long listed for um I think uh Corinne Corinne had got long listed for uh, the best debut British film at the BAFTAs last year or something like that for The Power. So, yeah, it's, it's been really well received. Oh, nice, nice. So, with, you know, just doing, um, was it Stumped, the film that you directed? Yeah, that was my short film, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, with just doing that, and, but... You know, like, I think a lot of people do talk about editing as, like, a second director because sometimes the fil- that's when the film really comes together in the editing yeah. booth, right? But just with that, like, what was it that kind of made you think, hey, I can get behind the camera, I can really tell a great story given the opportunity? Um, I guess just a hunger, like um, a hunger and a like a confidence that is um, earned through working with other directors as as their editor, like um, and seeing them. It's it's funny. People have some people, not everybody, but some people have a misconception that an editor basically sits in the room and does what the director tells them to do, and that is so far from the truth. We quite often actually present the director with the first version of the film more often than not that we do and and if you're doing it right quite often the director doesn't change a lot like so it's 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 the 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 first thing they see is your interpretation of the footage that you've been given it's not like you've not really been instructed to how to cut those shots together it's Mm. all on instinct and all on all on just uh based on experience and and your um i guess we all have our own slight differences in cinematic language and grammar and how we like construct a scene and and that and i guess having done that enough like uh, i mean I, I, I don't know what the total is but i think i've probably got like 15 or so feature film credits under my na- under my name and a, f- a few tv shows i think um like the confidence i get from yeah, presenting a, presenting a, an edit of a scene or the whole thing to a director and then going, yeah, great. Like, might want to tweak a little bit here or there, but generally, you know, like you've done a pretty good job. Like, and and that gives you the confidence um, to know how a scene is shot, like to know how a scene should be covered. Um, and obviously, you want to sort of bring your own stamp to it. And like, but I do feel like sitting in an edit suite with countless countless different directors has been like a free film school in a way because you also hear it's almost like therapy as well like when you sit in an edit in an edit suite you 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 hear a lot of the horror stories like of what happened on set because you're not you're not there yeah yeah. 
it's a safe space for a director. Like <laughs> to just offload all of the all of the trauma that went on during production. Um, and I guess you learn as much from just listening to those anecdotes and stories as you do from actually working on the film. Um, so yeah, I guess that, like I mean like, like I sort of touched upon slightly a minute ago. I mean I went to university and did filmmaking at university, so I had a sort of foundation from that sort of mm. um but never really um uh yeah never really pushed on as a director from there because I went to university thinking I was going to do directing and fell in love with editing uh, like because I was young and didn't really know what editing was at the time and it was yeah it was through doing my degree that I fell in love with editing and then that became my passion and my career choice for for well for the last 20 years really um and so I, I was not somebody who was like constantly banging the drum that I needed to direct. But when Ben presented me with this opportunity and and I uh, responded to the script, I thought, yeah, this is something I want to give a go. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting because um yeah, I, one of my friends Emily Al Fadi, you know, and she a bit similar to you. She started off editing, but has moved behind the camera a little bit of late. And yeah, she's like the way she talks about it, you know, having to bring that vision to the director and be like, yo, this is what I think the film is, you know? And I always find, it seems really interesting because, you know, in doing that, because, you know, they haven't necessarily given you notes, be like, yo, I want this scene to be this and this to be that. So, I mean, sometimes they have. Sometimes, to yeah. be fair, like yeah, of course they have. But some, but a lot of the time, you'll find that a bit a director is so busy doing production that they haven't really had a chance yet. Like, so you just crack on with it. Yeah, but it's like, um, do you kind of get a taste of their previous work to kind of let you think this is what they would want, or do you just watch the footage and go? No, this is what speaks to me. Yeah, you, I, I think if you're, I think you have to have confidence in letting it speak to you. Like, yes, you, if there is, if there is a previous body of work, then you will watch it. Um, but I think you get into trouble if you start to second guess what you think a director wants. I think you, I th I, I, personally, I just, I don't try and do that. Like, I just try and, present the best representation what I think is the best representation of this scene with the footage that I've been given um and um and then we and then we sometimes like uh, like sometimes I've been been asked to start the scene completely from scratch like again like with notes with with more of, uh, of a specific direction from the director and that's totally fine like I think that's one of the things you have you have to have not even a thick skin, you just have to not take anything personally. If you spent three days cutting a scene and then a director comes in and goes, actually, that's not how I imagined it. Can we try it this way? you just got to go, yeah, of course you can, because that's the fun of it. Like, um, um, But yeah, I, th I think if you try and second guess, uh, like, obviously, I think if you've worked with, uh, like, I've not, I've not worked recurringly a lot with, a direct, with directors. I've worked with a few a couple of times. But a lot of the directors I've worked with have been first time directors themselves when they've been making their first film. Um, so it's harder to get a sense of their previous body of work. If, if it's some, I mean, obviously they might have done shorts or music promos or commercials, but sometimes that's not actually that relevant. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the time, actually, it's about discussions about um, shared, shared taste, uh, about films, that, um, films to watch in, 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 preparation and what um what other films might be giving off the same tone they're not, they're not ever sort of saying look let's copy this scene but it might be saying the feeling of that scene is what i'm trying to convey in this scene um so it's just about informing yourself that way okay no that makes a lot of sense man that makes a lot of sense now when you read the script what was it that like jumped out you at look <laughs> here we go again when you read the script what was it that jumped out at you you know that, that made you think oh 
I can and really want to tell this story. Um, I I enjoyed the script. Like for something that is a survival thriller, I really enjoyed the journey the characters go on. Um, we're pitting young, uh, urban, like youthful Britain uh, against old tradition, uh, um, aristocracy. Um, I just loved the sort of the two opposing sides of that story, like to have these young kids who aren't from very prosperous backgrounds um, versus um, a family that have inherited wealth, presumably for centuries, like, and have acres and acres of land on which to play. Mm. I just love the idea of that being a battleground and those being the two sides. Um, And, um, yeah, and it was, but it was, a, but it felt adventurous and it felt fun, even though it, at times, like obviously, we've got some harrowing deaths and some pretty gruesome action at times. Um, but I always like thought there was elements of like even things like Stand by Me and um, uh, films that I grew up watching where kids set out on a journey, even like The Goonies. I mean, there's there's not a lot in this film that you in Hounded that you could say is a reference to The Goonies, but it still had that feeling of kids going out beyond their comfort zone yeah yeah um and so those those sort of films i really enjoyed growing up obviously um and yeah i just i just felt that when i when i read this script it's the opportunity to make something that is uh hopefully commercial that people will want to watch but also is saying something about how the rich view the poor in in britain um and i mean obviously we started working on it in 2019 and and in the three years that have passed since it's just become more and more pertinent uh, given the scope of the sort of economic landscape in britain right now um it seems like it seems to be very pertinent right now yeah no definitely i mean did you have a say on like deaths and some of those things like, did any of that change in the um, making of the film? We, um, we actually did change, um, and I'm not going to take credit for this, we changed the order of which people get killed off. Um, uh, and that is actually one of the blessings that COVID brought us, because mm. had we shot the film in 2020, people would die in the film in a different order. And um, in in during lockdown, when we realised that this film wasn't going to get made for a good couple of like it was going to be delayed production wise for like a good few months, if not more, we took that opportunity to actually um, share the script with some like people that we really trusted and started getting some opinions on what they thought of it. People like who read scripts for a living and like other yeah. filmmakers and. Um, and actually, a couple of times, the same comic kept coming back, which was the order of the deaths is a bit too obvious and a bit too predictable. Um, and so that actually, we had a decent um, development Zoom session where we basically all sat down and went, well, actually, how can we make this less predictable? How can we make it far more interesting? How can we pull the rug from underneath our protagonists? And um, and without giving away too many spoilers, that that got enacted and actually yeah I mean I'm much happier that we that we did do that because essentially again trying not to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it yet but the the first person who dies actually leaves the other three far more uh it makes them feel like that sense of being fish fish out of waters is heightened even more than it was in the original version of deaths because um Mm. Like all of a sudden, they've got to, they've got to really step up, whereas before they had somebody who was stepping up for them. I yeah, I have to say that was one of the things because I thought that person might get through, right? Mm. I mean, when you watch something like this, you know there will be deaths, right? No one's getting out clean, and no. so you think you look at the characters and you think to yourself, hmm. They seem like they're a liability. I think that one's going to bite it. Well, and exactly that. And in yeah. the first, in the first version of the script, the person who seems like he might be a like, I've, I've said he. I don't think that's giving too much away. But I think the person who you thought might be a liability was the first to get got. 
And then mm. it was like, well, actually, if we don't do that, what? how can we be more interesting? Yeah, so, yeah, the first one that goes, I yeah, I was definitely like, no, I thought, damn. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and the way they go, I was just like, oh, that's not, that's not fun. That's definitely no, no. not fun. <laughs> well, it's called, it is called Hounded for a reason. <laughs> well, but the thing is, though, Tommy, the dogs look so cute. They look friendly dogs. Like, you want to sit down and be, hey, buddy, how you doing? I mean, I mean the truth is, those hounds are, they are very, they are actually very uh, playful animals. Um, and, um, but what was very amusing was um, we, we obviously, so we're, we're already in our first week of production and we, I think we'd shot three days. And um, uh, on the fourth day, I think it was that we had, was the first day where we had hounds in to film and um, they come in pairs. So you, you always get two. Like they're they're trained. They're not, and I should say, there's no such thing as film hounds. They're not trained for camera. They don't take direction. They <laughs> basically do the what they're, they they basic. Well, they basically do as close to what their master tries to command them to do as possible, um, which isn't always <laughs> successful, and certainly isn't always on camera. Um, but anyway, so fourth day, these hounds turn up, and we had sixteen of them, and. Um, it's at that point that um, Malachi and Junior, who play the brothers in the film, both turn around to me and say, don't like dogs. And I'm like, you probably should have mentioned that uh, prior to us um, bringing in 16 massive blackhounds. Um, and they were, like for grown men, they were making some very whimperish noises. Um, and so we actually had to have a, a quote-unquote uh a familiarization session where basically these these two lads basically had to be jumped on and licked by these hounds that they were petrified of and and it's not just like it's it's okay being petrified of one dog but 16 dogs that just want to play because they think you're a toy yeah um yeah i mean bless them they made they made some very high-pitched noises in that <laughs> session um but to their credit by the end of the day they were they were actually posing with the hounds with for photos. So we, um, if nothing else, we achieved um, two grown men's fear of dogs. <laughs> I, I'm sure they appreciate you telling the world <laughs> of, of their fear. <laughs> well, they, I think they, I think they'll be glad there's no outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> the, although having being scared of dogs isn't necessarily a bad thing for this no uh, of course yeah 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 <laughs> a very real lived fear yeah <laughs> i mean the first dog we meet that's the kind of dog i'm kind of i would envision would be uh, in, the, in, in the in the in the very first burglary you mean yeah 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 yes. yeah 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 yes yeah, well, that was the irony. We wanted to get something there that was like a proper, almost like the dog from the thing or something like that. Mm. Like, um, and um, yeah, this big sort of like really like vicious looking thing, which again turns out to actually be quite docile and a bit of a bit of a cutie. Um, but yeah, so we yeah, I mean, we were certainly playing on those uh, expectations there. Um, but yeah, the truth is, these these sixteen hounds that turned up, they yeah, they did they. <laughs> They only take direction if you basically throw cooked meat in the direction you want them to go in, and then they'll chase after. It. I mean, we we had to resort to all sorts of tricks with them. We were putting, we were put, uh, like basically putting cooked rashers of bacon inside actors' pockets for them to try and find. And at one point, we were literally throwing hounds on a, one of the, one of the poor actors was lying down while another hound was just jumping on top of him and like getting the camera in there as close to it as we could. I mean, yeah, again, some of the noises of fear, I don't think are acting. I think they're just um, very, very genuine. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Yeah, that sounds uh, like it might be, might have been an interesting time. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was, it was it, I mean, interesting is not the word I would use. It was, um, it was <laughs> exasperating, I think. It's like, I mean, there's, yeah, you, like, the problem is, as a director, you're trying to be prepared, and um, 
I storyboarded all of the sequences with the dogs just because I, I knew it was going to be hell. Like, I knew it was going to be difficult. There's no, there's a reason there's the classic cliche of don't work with animals and children. It's like, mm -hmm. um, like, and it's all well and good working with animals that have actually been trained for camera. But these ones, like I say, these ones hadn't. Um, so I storyboarded these sequences, not because I was like, gone ho about like, well, these are the shots that I absolutely have to have. But, I, honestly, within about three hours of trying to film these dogs, I'd literally throw my storyboards in the air and almost stormed off because I was like, well, they're useless. <laughs> so it was a case of uh, very much just feeling our way through some of those scenes. And just uh, res we responded to the dogs rather than the dogs responding to us. Right. OK. So how did it add any extra time to the shoot? Uh, no, no, to be fair, it was, no, um, no, because, like, we always got, there, there were, uh, so Stephen, who owns the hounds, he was always up front, um, and there was a, a colleague of his called Dom, who works with him as well, they do, they still do a lot of this, um, obviously, fox hunting is banned, but they do um, what they call trail hunting, which is where they lay a scent for the dogs yeah, to, yeah. And, and so somebody goes out in the morning, and then an hour or two later, they let the dogs, they attach the dogs to the scent. And then the dogs just basically run after this scent for a couple of miles, all excited and aroused by the smell of it. Um, and so we'd, we'd um, yeah, got in touch with one of those uh, organized hunts. And, um, yeah, they explained to us very early on. They said, look, the dogs are incredibly energetic, but they will hit, a, they will hit the edge of, at the shelf of their tiredness and then after that you're done with them so we always knew we only had a certain amount of time per day that we could film them so it was a it, it was a case of just get get as much as you can in that window and then um so we, we yeah we were fortunate in that regard like we managed we did manage to get everything we needed well we got everything we got as much as we thought we needed and then it's one of those like i say because we're very much the footage we were responding to them. It was, that was definitely, some of those sequences were very much like make it work in the edit and just hope you've got it in the can. Right, right. Uh, would you say that was the hardest part of the shoot, the whole dog part, or was something else even more challenging? No, that was definitely, yeah, that was, that was definitely the hardest, yeah. I mean, there was that fourth, that fourth day uh, when we first had the hounds in, uh, uh, I'm not afraid to say like, at lunchtime, I literally went into a room by myself and just questioned what on earth I was doing. <laughs> like, because it was, it was, I was, that was the, that was as despairing as I got because I was like, this is mad. Why did I agree to do this? Um, and, uh, and Ben, the producer, to be fair to him, pulled me to one side. He said, look, you're trying to chase the perfect shots. Your storyboards aren't going to work. Like, just get in there. Like, just get in there and get messy. And we did. And we got great stuff in the afternoon. And pretty much everything you see from that first uh, from that first death with the hounds is um, is, is from that day. Uh, okay. Okay. Nice. And you, so you storyboard, you, well, you attempted to storyboard the dog parts. What about the rest of the film? Do you storyboard or did you take a different approach? Um, a storyboard, a storyboard uh, scenes which I can't um, fully work out how I need to cover them, if that makes sense. So certain scenes, I, like in in my mind, I can just write, okay, I know exactly, I know I need this wide shot, I need these two close ups, and I need this, whatever it is. Um, where it got more a bit more complicated, um, if I'm not and maybe it's just as my inexperience as a, as a director at this stage, but if I wasn't sure exactly how many setups I thought I needed to cover a scene, then I would just storyboard it and try and figure, just storyboard it as if it was edited and then just um, figure out if actually some of those storyboards are all part of the same angle. It's just that they've developed slightly so mm. that I could figure, uh, figure out just if, if actually, is that two shots or is actually, is actually those two frames that, are, that aren't, side by side on the storyboard are they actually the same setup just developed later on um and then yeah and then and then i did i would do a shot list or a little camera map sometimes as well like i, I didn't have a hard or fast rule for like how, how to 
prepare for all of it. Like some some days, some locations were late, as in we didn't agree the location till we're already in production. So I I I didn't when you when you're already on the hamster wheel of production, I didn't really find myself having the time to storyboard stuff because I. Like I'm an able drawer, but I'm not a fast drawer. So yeah. I knew it would take. I knew it would take time. Uh, so sometimes it would be more a case of me sketching out the location or the room that we were going to film in, and just figure out, just putting the little triangles where I want the camera, and figuring out which which ones, and and then almost doing a priority list and saying, right, well, if we're really up against it, which one am I getting rid of? Uh, which one can I live without? Okay. Now, what is it always fascinates me, like on how you select those shots, right? How do you, like, when you read something, do, do you automatically think that's a close up? Okay, so that shot, that's a panning shot. Like, what? How does that come to you? Um, I don't think it comes on first read. Certainly not to me. I mean, it might do to others. Um, I I spent a good six weeks prior to shooting like prior to going into pre-production uh rereading the script like in in meticulous like detail like um and writing i i had like a a, a, a notebook where i basically wrote everything that qu i questioned in that script in that scene so for instance they're doing like we start with uh, our gang doing a burglary of a uh, of a nice sort of country looking house and uh, the very first thing I would write would be like how many times have they done this before how mm. many like are they nervous about doing this do they like all these sort of questions that the actors might want to ask me um, and I might want to ask myself but in doing that I start to figure out what's important about the scene um, and what the feeling is for that scene um, I don't always get it like you don't always find the answer or what sometimes I don't even know what I'm looking for but I'm just almost doing it as an exercise but but what that might say is like oh actually there's a lot of like so in the second burglary for instance when Chaz goes in Chaz is in for the first time like yeah. it's the first time he's ever stepped over that threshold that threshold is a big deal like it's like starting to put emphasis on like the doorway the doorway then becomes a gateway to Chaz sort of becoming part of the gang fully initiated and all that sort of stuff. So it's about slowing down that moment a little bit and just um, putting the emphasis on the door creaking and little things like that. Like, um, just like, there's like, like I say, there's no sort of right or wrong answer for that. For me, it's just like, I just, I almost just do, um, I forget what they call it, but it's like a brainstorming. I just almost word association with scenes okay. and all that sort of stuff. And and in doing that, I think I find what I feel personally is important about the scene. And and if it's uh, and sometimes it might be that um, the the Redwick the aristocratic family are domineering, and so therefore are we always shooting up at them so they feel big and like omnipresent and or and therefore are we always shooting down at a kid act like at our youth mm. actors and, and and little things like that and i mean that might be really obvious to some directors and some filmmakers but like i say having having less experience having not done a lot of it myself i, f I feel like that's just my sort of homework for want of a better for better for better phrase yeah um yeah and and then it's like it's it's I think the more you do it, then the quicker you get with each scene. You kind of go, okay, well, this is this is harking back to that feeling I had earlier. And and um, I mean, we chose like when when the kids first get abandoned in the field. I really wanted them to, as an example, I really wanted them to feel like little little blots on the landscape. Like so, we really pulled wide to just show how vast that the English countryside can be. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with it. That's actually quite intimidating because if you cannot see a building or any sign of civilization, and in in a modern era where people are dependent on phones and they've had their phones taken away from them, mm. and they and and these kids, you could ask these kids which way north is and they wouldn't have a clue. Like well, no, hey, one of them knew how to make a compass. Yeah, but he didn't have the needle with which to make <laughs> it, which is why which is why I always love that gag. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah, and I just thought, like, so it was always a case of like, and then, and again, that's where you're, you're looking at your references as well and the things that you're thinking about. And if you watch Stand By Me, there's a lot of shots in Stand By Me, which are shot from fields and fields away, mm. like where these, where these kids are just these four dots walking along the horizon. And so those are the sort of things I was feeling. Like, and the, the, I guess another thing we were always trying to do, Martina, who was the cinematographer, we talked a lot about um, uh, Westerns. Like we talked a, a lot about how Westerns incorporate landscape within, like uh, yeah. how the, how they frame a character, basically, um, and how the landscape within a Western is is like massively important. Um, so I watched quite a few Westerns, and obviously, like I mean, the standout ones for me are the Sergio Leone spaghetti Westerns. So watching things like a fistful of dollars and um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and all those sort of things, and and looking at how they frame certain bits and look, I'll be very honest, you, sometimes you do watch a scene and you go, oh, that, that'd be great for that moment. So you do borrow, like mm. like you're definitely borrowing sometimes a little framing here or there. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I think, um, you know, everyone would admit to that. Well, yeah, of course. Great. Well, what's it? I think Picasso <laughs> says great art is just good stealing. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. And um, The Harder They Fall last year was tremendous. You know, we got some uh, just those shots of people on the horizon and just, mm. yeah, I, I, I really love that one. But no, that makes, that's an interesting point. Uh, that's interesting, you know, because I, I, I mean, to be honest, Tommy, watching this, you never would have thought this, you know, first time director. But oh, like, thank you. That's great. Honestly. And it, it's not just because you're sitting in front of me, but. I really enjoyed this film, right? Because I think mean, there's other films that have, you know, been kind of similar to this in, in you know, story. Like we, there's a film early 2000s, I think mean, it's Contender 7. Oh, uh, yes, I've, I'm aware of it. I've not seen it actually, yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then, that, was, that was really, uh, if I'm right in, was that, was that a found footage or was it really small budget, wasn't it? It was, like... it was small budget, I think it was like, an, a reality TV. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was almost like a Big Brother hunting thing, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Big Brother, that was the kind of because I think Big Brother was big at the time, and it was yeah. kind of playing on that. And then last year there was that American one that kind of got kept on getting pushed back, and it finally came out. Um, the hunt. I, the yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The hunt. Yeah, I yeah. mean, look, obviously, like, yeah, there's the hunt, and also. Um, like uh, don't breathe is another sort of mm. uh, like where where the tables get turned on the invaders. I mean, yeah, I mean in that in that regard, and I mean if you go way way back, there's um there's a, a really old film I think from 1927 which is called The Most Dangerous Game, and it's like I think wow. that's one of the first the first examples of um, humans being hunted on in cinema. I think um, yeah. So look, we're not we're not reinventing the genre there. Um, no. But, this... but, but, but what I wanted to do was try and put a slightly different slant on it, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, no, but that's the thing, right? Like, we, we, we've got like, examples of this type of story, but this didn't feel like, you know, we're just walking in their footsteps. It, it felt you brought something fresh to the table. And I think that's what was really interesting about it. You know, there was... At the beginning, what I thought was really interesting is usually when you see people doing crime and stuff like that, it's a, it's like you don't really get a justification or it's, well, there's no, nothing else we can do. But in this, Leon is like, we could get other jobs. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, nah, I what, do a zero contract. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you thought, yeah, that's honest. Right, yeah. but we don't get that often, yeah. you know. What I mean? Yeah, and so there was these conversations and and just like the twists, right? Because both groups have their own kind of moral code, yes, which absolutely, going yeah. by, which I yeah. thought again really interesting. Well, it, so, and there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels between the two groups as well, mm. like, um, which is which is a testament to Ray and Dean's writing. I think that was always very very obvious from the start that actually you could 
uh, I, I know what side of the fence I'm on in this in this film, yeah. but I think there'll be viewers who are on the other side of the fence, oh. and I think they'll probably enjoy it for all the reasons that I that they probably shouldn't. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there is that, and so that's the thing. I, I thought this film it stands on its own two feet. It it tells its own version of the story, and the it's a really nice little playoff. There's, I think you get to a point and I think, I was thinking, oh, I think this might happen. But then it gets flipped again and you're like, oh, I did not see that. And that was good. Right. That was right. nice. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's like, did you, like when you read it, was that the exact ending or was there any changes to that part? Um, well, uh, oh, Tommy, he's still there. Sorry, it just oh. went. Uh... Yeah, yeah, you, yep. I, I, you, you froze for a minute. It just, it just dropped for a second. Yeah, so obviously we we talked about the change of death order. Now, uh, the change of death order does not just drastically impact who died first, but it also impacted. Therefore, who died last out of the out of our gang, um, and so that had quite a different emotional uh, uh, payoff, I guess, for want of a better mm. word. Um, um, and then, uh, like the scene, the scene uh, later on, which is a little bit of a nod to American Werewolf in London, um, was always yeah. there. That was always that was always like that. Uh, uh, the choice that that. Um, our final character, again, I'm trying not to spoil it. Uh, the choice that our final character gets presented with was always there, but we always wrestled with what the decision should be. Um, right. and, uh, um, and how much the aristocracy should get away with was the other thing. Mm. Um, and actually, like, the, the cynic in me, and um, because I, I wanted, I think, I hope, we've made a film that's got actually a fair bit of optimism and heart about it but actually it's quite a cynical ending in that yes the rich just carry on getting away with it um but i wanted to i, I thought that was quite important we debated it there was quite a lot of conversation around that when we were developing uh, when we were redrafting the script over the covid period it was like oh, is there an opportunity to do something different with the ending but actually we we did stick with the original ending even though we tried a few different things um because ultimately the truth is the rich can buy themselves out of trouble, and that was mm. the point. Um, um, so yeah, so that, that so that didn't change, although it wasn't through uh, just exercising ideas there. Yeah, but it was a more a case of making sure we've got it right. Yeah, no, but I I really liked that ending because when you think about it, yeah, of course, right? And like, how many times have we seen? those parallels in real life you know you think epstein right mm. he got convicted for pedophilia but then was able just to carry on yeah right it's like boris got caught at parties was able to carry on for a good chunk of time yeah. it well, and, and, and that's the thing i mean we one of the themes that we were really talking about when we were making this was about the sense of entitlement and i think that that is the ultimate uh, like comment on it at the ending. It's just like we'll just buy our way buy our mm. way out of this. Um, yeah, but I mean, we and we, but we talked about entitlement with um, the kids as well who were playing kids from South London. Like um, entitlement, your sense of entitlement exists whether or not you're born into money or you're born into austerity. It's just the sense of entitlement is drastically different. It's, it's almost about what you feel you're not entitled to, like for for, for large portions of the uh, like uh, more poorer backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there was an interesting conversation between two of the characters, and it was just like, oh shit! Like it, it would have been interesting to see where that might have gone if things had gone a little bit differently. But everyone had their you know i think sometimes when you get groups of people 
they all seem a bit similar, mm. right? I just remember watching some episodes of Dawson's Creek, and I was mm. like, everyone talks the same. And yeah. it's just like, in a group of friends, not everyone doesn't talk exactly the same, you know? But we, we often do see that in things. But in this, everyone had their own distinct character, which I thought really played well. And, you know, because we, it's a very small cast, but everyone, you know, from the red, red, the red wicks, the red yes. wicks, or, or red, <laughs> red, X, red X, I'm told it's actually pronounced, but we were always ah, pronouncing okay. it. We were always <laughs> pronouncing it red wicks. <laughs> but yeah, everyone just really gave a, just a really great performance, you know, like, how were you able to get that from them? Is it just, you know, because obviously they, they've all been in other things and they've done great performances, but with this, did you kind of talk to anyone, give them like playlists? What was the thing which you utilised to get those performances? Um, I mean, it's different for each person. Like, and some conversation, some actors want more more of a conversation than others. Like, um, some don't want any. So, like, in all honesty, um, uh, I, like, and we we. I obviously got I obviously got to spend a lot more time with the four kids like um so there's so they felt like and also they they're less experienced as actors as well because obviously they're up against Samantha Bond and Larry Lamb and Nick Moran mm. who've got they've got years and years and years of experience um um but that's not to say that they were found wanting because I I think they're brilliant in this like I think and um, I think um uh, a couple of the performances um, really, really looked like have, have drawn people in. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, like for instance, Hannah, who plays Vix, we, me and her talked a lot before, um, and we talked about um, her upbringing and uh, perceptions of who she should be in society or who she should be as an actor, mm. and how Vix is kind of a great representation of who she 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 might really be or some something along those sort of lines yeah we just we talked a bit more about backstory with Vix. we talked about maybe she she well i mean it, and it gets alluded to slightly in some of her dialogue in the in the film but like in early versions of the draft earlier versions of the script there was a lot more about her having an abusive upbringing so it was like about maybe going to a slightly darker place for her um with with Chaz, who's played by Malachi, it was about ambition. It was about breaking out of a mold. Like, and um, we talked about sort of what upbringing he'd had, and like, um, and even just something as simple as him being an actor in a family of non-actors is is quite uh, quite different. Like, mm. um, and and just seen as a little bit more, like not more, but as in uh, unique. If, if yeah. Want, yeah, yeah, unique. Like. Um, struggling to find my words but but he like and how like so obviously he could he could portray that to Chaz like and um and talking about friends he'd brought up, been brought up with and how actually they were only ever really like some of them were just one bad decision away from getting into a life of, of small crime and things like that um so yeah I mean a lot of that's about their background experience and then and then like um with some of the older actors, like um, uh, sometimes, in all honesty, I didn't have as much time as ideally I would have liked um, in preparation. But that's because we were a small, small budget film, and um, they have other commitments, and uh, they were on other jobs, and we were only getting them for three or four days out of the whole shoot. Um, but you, but you have a conversation beforehand if you can. Like I had a great conversation with James Lance who plays Hugo. I had a really good conversation and we talked about our relationship with our parents and um, and how how that might affect his choices in the role. Um, and I spoke to uh, James Faulkner who was already very very uh, educated in a lot of the traditions of. Um, like the red coats and and mm. all like all the way back through like British like he knew like it was very apparent very early on that he knew a lot about like the British Empire and like colonization and all of that sort of stuff. So he was able to 
sort of bring all of his education on that and and sort of put that into his role of Remington. Um, so yeah, like yeah, every every act is very different. Um, and some want you to uh, some like sometimes they want to know just where they've been in the in the story, and sometimes it's more a case of like it's just about what to react to there and then rather than where they've been. And, and yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the, that's the one place for me as a, as a first time feature director where I was least confident because um, obviously that's uh, like, it, technically I was confident that I knew how to cover a scene. Technically mm. I was confident that I knew if we'd, I knew if we'd be able to shoot the scene for me to make it work in the edit. Uh, the great unknown quantity for me going into this with the exception of having done a, a, a short film, which was only a three day shoot with only three actors in, um, was being able to, to uh, work with and collaborate and direct uh, like nine principal cast, basically. Um, and and I, I, I think, I mean, the key to that is just being very honest, like, um, and um, not being afraid to give your very honest opinion. You know, you never, it's not that, like not even a question of being critical or anything like that, but like just watching a performance and just saying, well, okay, um, I wasn't quite feeling this, which I thought I would do, or uh, what what you just gave there was lovely, but maybe if you could slow it down a little bit or take a take a breather here or there, like um, and so yeah, uh, but I guess I guess every director is different with every actor who is also different. So in that in that sense, you are almost an infinite number of combinations of how you deal with how one all directors deal with all actors if you know what i mean mm. yeah no for real it's um <clears throat> it's always interesting hearing these different approaches to things you know because everyone comes at it in so many different ways you know like what do you think like you know obviously you, you just talked about the interaction with the actors and, you know, you're also nine principal actors, but as you said, 16 furry friends as well. And, 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 and four them. horses as well. <laughs> I mean, for, fortunately, the horses, fortunately, the horses were proper film trained horses. Like um, there's a company called Stampede who um, did did all our horse horses for us. And they were great. Like, right. like they would go exactly where you needed them to go. <laughs> uh, so in, 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 uh, up and coming films, maybe more horses, less dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, and that's and that's the other thing. I've sort of like the West. Like I talked about the Western cinematography earlier. It's like, like when I was looking for films to reference and look at, like you start to think, well, well, what films have got loads of horses in? Well, obviously it's westerns. So mm. it was it was very useful in that regard to just watch a load of how do you shoot horses, like, and the very different ways of shooting horses. I mean, the horses in the good, the bad, and the ugly, or fistful of dollars, are shot quite differently to the horses in like Seven Samurai or something like that. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. So, other than those things, do, what else do you think this experience has kind of taught you to go forward with? Ooh, uh, let's have a think about that. Um, I, I don't, I like. I don't know if it taught me or maybe reaffirmed, but it's just like, just a willingness to work. Like, um, and um, I think as a director, like you've, like I always remember watching this um, back behind the scenes footage of uh, uh, Sidney Lumet on um, Dog Day Afternoon. And he was running around the set outside the bank that Al Pacino's holding up. And he's running. He is sprinting from one side of the set to the other, shouting on a megaphone. Like, and I just thought, like, there's a guy who is just leading through infectious energy. Like, mm. um, and setting, not, not saying, like, everybody has to run everywhere A to B or anything like that. But it's just, like, I, I found myself, like, I'd be like, I knew how tight time was. We had a short schedule. And um, and so it would be like, right, we're moving from this field to that field now. And it'd be like, where's Tommy? And they'd be like, oh, there he is. He's already sprinting across the field. <laughs> I'm like, come on, let's go. Because I just felt like, like even when it's going 
like when the dogs aren't going, <laughs> when the dogs aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Like, there's a reason I took myself off to the closed private room because I didn't want anyone else to see me despairing in that moment because yeah. and I'm set because then I'm setting a tone and I didn't want to set that tone. Um, I mean, look, it's it's it was tough, like at times, like and it's not um um. I'm cautious to sound like a, it was a rosy, like perfect production. It wasn't. The schedule was tight, and like, yeah, sometimes like it just gets really tense on set at times. But as long as you're doing it, I almost like I, I, like as long as you're doing it for uh, with the best of intentions, and it's and it's never personal. Like, like sometimes, yeah, you are raising your voice and saying, "Please, come on, please, guys, we really need to get going, get going." Like. Um, I had a when I used to play football as a youngster. I, was, uh, I had a moniker of Tommy two times because I always shouted everything twice, and um, I found myself doing it again on set. I just repeat the same instruction <laughs> twice, just straight off the bat. And I got called Tommy two times because there's a character in Goodfellas, like who's I think he says, "I'm gonna get, get the papers, get the papers," and it's like one of one of my football one of my football teammates had probably watched Good. Uh, good fellows that week and realised I was that guy and then I became Tommy two times on the football pitch ever after <laughs> I think you're, you're definitely right though it's like you can set the tone you know of, of what needs to be done and how it should be done right it is yeah I definitely found that on a lot of the work that I've done um the the energy that you bring can then be replicated in other people because they see you energized and people are just like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do this. This can be done. And everyone kind of can get into that kind of mindset and zone. So, yeah, you know, it's definitely a, an important... Yeah, and that's not... I, like, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who takes myself too seriously. Like, so it's, it's again, it's also setting that tone. It's like what yeah. we're doing when we're working is serious, but, like, let's enjoy it at the same time as well. So it's like trying to set that tone as well. Yeah. 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 I, I did um, a conference in Vancouver a few years back and we were like up at half five in the morning and we were going until like eight at night. And it was like a lot of work, but man, just thinking back to that, it was such a fun time because everyone, we just all worked together, supported each other and little things came up, but we were able to deal with them. And it's just like, I think it's those situations that you kind of can look back at and go, oh yeah, I can do this. I know how to do this. I've done it before in that instance. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, th I think the other thing is like, I think like what I was saying a minute ago was like, like that, um, that being prepared to, to graft, to be a hard worker. Like, um, I, I've never dealt with this myself, but you hear stories of like directors who are just like, oh, I'm not like, like, almost like I, I would be like helping people move equipment, and I know that there are directors who are like, well, look, I'm not doing that. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they might be, li they might listen to me and think, well, you're mad, you don't have to. But I'm like, I just like. If I'm prepared to muck in, then hopefully everyone else is prepared to muck in. And it just helps create that team ethic. Like, we're all working together. We're all in this together. And yes, okay, I'm the director on the film, but, like, that doesn't mean that I think I'm supposed to do any less work than anyone else. I feel like, in fact, I feel like I should be doing, if I don't feel like I'm doing twice as much as anyone else, I probably feel like I'm slacking. Hmm. Yeah. I, not, I, not to say that I was doing twice as much as anyone else. It's just that if I don't feel like it. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. Like, um, I worked at a cinema during when I was at uni. And I always thought, like, I can't ask people to do things that I'm not prepared to do myself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I think it's people respond to that mentality. Yeah. You know? Now, so I think that all reaffirmed what you could do but was there anything about this film which you were just like ah, I wish I had more time or more to do this was there stuff that you weren't able to do because of budget or anything else uh I mean I mean no director in the world is ever going to tell you he wants less time and less money so <laughs> I mean 
<laughs> if you'd have given me more money and more time, yes, I'm sure we would have done more. Um, <laughs> but there becomes a point where you, you, you just make with what you've got. Right. And, um, mm. and, and also I do, I do feel like actually having restrictions on time and restrictions on money that you can spend, they force you into a creative corner. Like, um, that, that I don't always see, uh, represented in some of these tentpole massive films where there is no ceiling and yeah. you know they've just always been told yes you can do what you want yes you can do what you want and actually they just become quite stale as, as a film by the end of it because there's it feels like they've not had to really get creative in terms of thinking their way out of these restrictions um I mean, there's a, there's a slew of films that have gone on to certain streamers recently, and I just watch them and just think they're so mediocre, and they've had unlimited resources, and I'm just like, doesn't, there's no guarantee of quality, is it, having quantity in terms of uh, finances and time? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely been, there's been a few ones that were talked about as being, oh, is this, and then I watched it, and I was like, I don't know what the fuck. They're, that just, they're just content. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just yeah. like story. Was there a story that was so sloppy? It was like yeah. effects, but boy, that yeah. was it. And and yeah, I think giving like having those restrictions definitely pushes you to be creative, to think out the box with things. Yeah, and it, and and I mean, going back, you asked me earlier about how to decide how. A, like whether we're panning on a shot or whether we're tight on a shot, sometimes they were, right, how can I shoot this scene with two angles, basically? Or sometimes how can I shoot the scene with one angle? Like one cut, like, mm. no, sorry, one shot, no cuts. Like, because, like, yeah, given more time, I probably would have tried three or four angles. But actually, you then really start to, uh, break down that scene and go right what is actually the vital thing here and if that is the vital thing how do I convey that to the audience um, through a single setup um, yes and yeah like I say if I'd have had another two three weeks of production I might not have been forced to think that way yeah no definitely definitely so you know this is Man, you finished it. I mean, um, how has the initial response been? Well, we so we had our world premiere at uh, Fright First on the August bank holiday. Um, that's the first public screening we had, obviously, being a world premiere. Um, and then it's that's uh, been its only screening so far. We're currently, where are we at? We're uh, at time of recording. We're in early October. It's coming out on October the 31st on all the digital platforms and then we're getting a, we're also getting a very small theatrical uh, release at a couple of um, showcase cinemas around the country oh, okay. um uh so the only response i've uh, been able to garner so far is from the audience that were there or the press that previewed it ahead of fright fest but so far so good yeah like what what's been really enjoyable is that people enjoyed it uh um really, really responded to some of the characters. Uh, but also um, what I've really enjoyed, which I wasn't, I, I, never, I, I don't know if I had anticipated or not, but what I've really enjoyed is actually that almost everybody comments on, that they like the fact that we're making a comment on class division in Britain and that they're, they're watching an enjoyable survival thriller, but also being provoked into thinking about that at the same time. Mm. Nice. Yeah, it, but sometimes those things aren't always that clear, and you're reading the editor notes that get sent through. You're like, uh, this film is talking about this and this, and you're like, I, I, I didn't never, get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I never yeah. saw that. If you hadn't yeah. said it in the notes, I would not. I have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think we're like I think like I don't think we're being. Like particularly subtle. I hope we're not being too on the nose, but um, I don't think we're. Yeah, we never we never were trying to shy away from ask, posing some of those questions. Um, so yeah, like, like it's good that people are talking about it. Mm, no, for sure, man, for sure. 
no, I, I really enjoyed it. And I think, yeah, it's people are going to definitely gravitate to it. Because I think it's just the conversations, you know, there's another thing, right? Oftentimes when you have groups, the conversation just feels odd. Like it'd be like, people don't talk like that. But in everything that was getting said in this, you know, it's just like, ah, oh, this reminds me of Bear Grylls. I fucking hate Bear Grylls. You know what I mean? It's just these yeah. little, just those little yeah. things. It just yeah, felt... The- yeah, really? the banter, the, the banter felt, yeah, the, yeah, the, it felt like, I mean, that was a great thing. These these four guys, like, hung out for about a week before we started filming and then spent three weeks together filming. But they really did feel like they'd known each other for years, which was great. Yeah, no, it, it's really good. So this is now done, essentially, you know what I mean? Yep, yep. Are, are, are you thinking about that next project? Have you started that next project? Like, what's going to be next, Tommy? Um, well, I mean, immediately next, I'm, I'm editing again. Uh, so I'm currently editing a series for ITV, which um, will be out in uh, spring 2023, I think. Um, okay. Which you... is... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I could, like, it's, on, it's on IMDb, so I don't think it's any secret. I'm doing a series called Malpractice, which is... Directed by Phil Barantini, who did Boiling Point. Oh, I really enjoyed Boiling Point. Yeah, that was, it was great. Yeah, yeah, um, and great in that. So, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm doing a couple of episodes out of five, um, and um, it stars Neve Algar from um, she was in Calm with Horses and uh, the Ridley Scott. Um, what's it called? The Wolves, uh, Raised by Wolves. Um, oh, yeah. um, and she's great. She's like she's the lead actor in it, and she's um she's phenomenal. Like she's great to edit. Um. So yeah. So that's been that's been the immediate thing. And then um yeah, there's a couple of conversations about uh what I might do next with a couple of different producers. Um, but nothing solid and nothing concrete yet. Okay. And um, you know, is this just really ignited that director kind of voice in your head? Like, do you want to? Do you direct more films or are you... Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm very fortunate and I don't take it for granted that I'm also, like, doing pretty well as, as an editor and it, mm. as, as its own thing. Um, and I never, as I said earlier, it's like I was never, it, like, I obviously chose editing as a career path for the last, well, close to 20 years. And... Um, I was never, I was never desperately in a rush. I know a lot of uh, filmmakers are banging the drum and they really want to be uh, a director, and then it's like, and they do other things to get there, and then they almost think that, oh, I've directed a film and I can draw a line in the sand now, and I'm never doing any of those previous things again. I, well, I was, I, I'm fortunate that a, I seem to be doing all right as an editor, but b, I absolutely love editing as well, like for other for other people's projects. Um, so I was never in a rush, and I'm still not in a rush to disown it. Like, mm. um, so, like, and that's which is quite nice because it means I can. I feel I feel like I can take my time about making sure that yes, I do want to direct again, and yes, I would like to direct more and more in the future, but it doesn't have to be immediate. So I can be a bit more selective about maybe what that might be next, and take my time with it while I continue to edit. That's cool, man. Yeah. Oh, awesome. But, you know, on, on the strength of this, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what you uh, you do next. And, you right. know, it, like, I really enjoyed, like, the power and um, some of your other stuff. So, yeah, on the editing front, I, you know, if, if you just do more of that in the next minute, hey, not a bad thing either. Yeah. Right. So, Tommy... Really appreciate the time. Great. Man. Thank you, Kevin. And thank, and thank you for the support. Really oh, appreciate it. No worries at all, man. I, you know what I mean? I just say what I see. And if, if I really enjoy a film, then boom, I'm, you know what I mean? That's it. So, yeah, no, it's a fantastic film. Great cast. You know, everyone involved did a, a really great job, man. So, yeah, congratulations, man. Congratulations. I hope when it hits, the, you know, everywhere, that people really um, get to it. And I kind of feel they will do, man. 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of those that it's going to come out on all the usuals like Amazon video, like to rent on Amazon and iTunes and Google Play and all those Sky stores and all that. But it's one of those ones where if people like it, please spread the word because we we might not get the loudest amount of press and advertising. So it'd be it'd be dependent on uh, everyone telling telling their mates to watch it. Mm, mm. Well, yeah, no, man, I think it will do well. You know what I mean? So, hey, good luck with that. And, yeah, when you've got another project, man, come back and let's have another sure. conversation. For sure. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you very much. People, go check out... Um, oh, my God, my mind just went <laughs> blank. How it's called Hounded. It? It's yeah. called Hounded. <laughs> oh, my days. I'm so sorry, Tori. I just suddenly, I just like, boom. I was like, what am I doing? Right? <laughs> yeah, go check out Hounded. <laughs> it's a great survival thriller. Yes. So uh, do that. Thanks, Tori. Thank you.